right, well, thanks for coming early for this. Uh, well, I'm sure it's going to be a great concert. Uh, this is Greg Thomas, class of 85, and uh, he was in the jazz program here. He's in the jazz band, and he's been here for a few days. They have a great lecture the other day, and Robert Glasper, who you all know, he's got his trio, and um, I'm going to turn things over to Greg, and they're, they're going to just chat for a while and see that what they come up with. Thank you, Monk. <laughs> and welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is pre-concert chat. How you doing, man? Good. Had a little six, five, six hour drive up here. Oh, from the city? Yeah, from New York, yeah, from Brooklyn. Okay, got you. Yeah, that's good. All right. So, um, as, as you were mentioning off camera, mm -hmm. that um, about, I guess, five months ago, um, there was an event at which I interviewed uh, Mr. Glasper. It was an event sponsored by the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. It was a jazz and R&B uh, discussion. Um, so that was, that was quite cool. And that was in front of an audience of music students at your mm -hmm. alma mater, the new right. school. Uh -huh. So we went into, into some kind of musical depth in terms of your history. Here I'd like to um, direct it for the students here and the students looking. Um, some of the questions I ask will be kind of directed towards them and where they're at. Mm. All right. So the first question I have for you has to do with the fact that you have your, a very identifiable voice and style um, as a as a band leader, as a as a as a performer, as a musician, um, even as a composer. And um, I, I'd like you to talk about the importance of of an individual voice because you know in the music's history that was like the thing. That used to be the thing. It's like you got to have your voice. Um. But, but, but in music schools, when you have, instead of it being on the bandstand and through traveling on the road with big bands and that type of thing where it was an apprenticeship process, mm -hmm. now that you have a lot of music schools, mm -hmm. it seems to be more of a, not a cookie cutter, but less, yeah. maybe cookie cutter, less <laughs> of the individuality. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Because I think the young people mm -hmm. here, they, you know, I think they need to hear about the importance of that. Yeah, totally. It's um, uh, I, there's a good the, the the music in schools is good and bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. For the most part, it's good because if it wasn't music in schools, I wouldn't be sitting here. Right. You know, I'd be somewhere in Houston at somebody's church. You know, playing in church, being that cat that's really good right. in Houston. You know, but um, I was able to get a full scholarship to go to college to go to New York. So that's why I made it there, you know. I mean, everybody, most, Miles Davis went to music school. I mean, that's, you know, that's the good thing about school. They get you where you need to be, you know. Some people don't get ahead in life because, simply because of the, uh, where they are. Simply because of the geographical thing, not because of a talent thing or right. uh, anything like that. They're just not, you got to move where the food is unless you're going to be hungry. <laughs> it's simple. Right. <laughs> Right. You know, so many people are sitting in the desert like, I'm hungry. And I'm like, you need to go where the food is, you know, because and they don't want to take, make the sacrifice to do it. And it, it, it can be hard, right. you know, but luckily through school, they take some of that padding off. It makes it less hard okay. because of school. When you're grown, it's like, move to New York and you have nothing, you know, then it's like, OK, that's a little bit harder because now where are you going to live? You know, there's no dormitory and, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. You grown now. Right. So it, it's a little harder. But for me. It was, it was school was the thing, and um, you know, yeah. A lot of times with schools, you know, you have teachers in the schools most of the time that a lot of them are sometimes failed musicians, and you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And they can teach, but they can't teach you how to be yourself. You know uh, what I mean? Okay. Um, some schools have great teachers like that. New school had great teachers like that. They actually had teachers that, you know, were on amazing records. Like one of my teachers was Reggie Berkman. You know. What else do you need? John you know? Coltrane. Reggie, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Persip, you know? Right. I had cats teaching me that play with Bird, you know what I mean? Right. So that's a different thing because right. they were around all those individual cats and they, they understand the thing. They're not failed musicians or anything. Right. They're in schools because they want to teach us, give, the, give us what they know, not right. because that's all they got, you know? Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, before music became a music business, per se, it was really cool to be yourself and have your own voice. And that's what it was about, you know, everybody who, who's different. Who, that's why you, so many different groups and even individual artists, they, you look in the, in the 70s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, there were so many different kinds of artists, 
looking different, sounding different, the music was different, blah, 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 and everybody can make it, you know? Nowadays, it's like literally like three artists you got to fit in that mold of. If you're a black singer and you're a male, you got to fit somewhere in the Chris Brown mold. You know, if you're female, you got to fit in the Beyonce mode. You know, and then, you know, I went to high school with Beyonce. So that's another individual that I, I know for, a, I knew her for, for a long time, you know. So, um, but those are certain modes that people say, okay, now we need you to be like that because that makes money. Versus people taking the time. And, you know, they used to even have a thing called um, artist development, you know, in record labels. They would sign somebody and put you through the ringer to help you figure out how to, you know, do shows and be on stage, talk to the press, all these things. Now they just sign you and throw you out there because they just want to make the quick dollar, especially now because record labels are folding and all that. So they don't have time for no artist development. They don't care, you know? <laughs> so, but, you know, the artists that have an individual voice, individual voice are the artists that last and, and the, those are the artists that people remember. You know, that's just a real thing. Um, I think you know, rel relative to the students, it's really important for them to think about the same things for themselves. Totally, yeah. And, 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 and it's hard to be like, have your individual voice, go. You know, it's like, <laughs> I didn't know I had a voice until people started telling me, yo, man, I was at a rehearsal, and the cat was like, yo, man, give me that, like, a, a, like a, a Glasper kind of sound. You know, I remember when I first heard that. I was in college. Oh, wow, that's cool. I was actually still, was I still in college? I was still in college, but I was like a senior in college, and it was like some of the cats at the school were having a rehearsal for something, and and somebody told me that like he was like yeah it's been a Glasper sound I was like wow really <laughs> <laughs> have a sound that's, yeah, that's cool wonderful. you know what I mean that's wonderful. because and some, sometimes somebody else has to actually tell you they have to tell you you have a sound because you don't really realize you have a sound right. until somebody tells you then you go oh snap maybe I do have a sound <laughs> right you know but other than that it's like Oh, I do, you know, and then you start realizing when people, like I started realizing through the years, people were saying, you know, your compositions are different. They're kind of not like blah, 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 blah. They kind of have this feel to it. And then you know, I realized what I did was, you know, I grew up in church and I never, I never ignored my influences. You know what I mean? So, um, especially when I'm writing music, when I'm making a composition of my own, I never ignore my church influence or my R&B. You know, my mom was a singer. I grew up. I grew up in clubs. You know, she didn't let she didn't let babysitters watch me. She would take me to. I was three years old at the club. You know, in the room in the back. You know, so she could check on me between songs. You know, you all right? All right. I'm everyone. You know. Um, so I grew up with all these all these sounds and going to rehearsals and everything. And so when I when I got into jazz and I, I pretty much got it really started like doving into jazz when I like ninth grade or maybe eighth grade. Mm -hmm. When I got into that, you know, what I did was I learned how to play it authentically because I wanted to sound like Oscar Peterson. I loved Oscar Peterson. My mom was playing in the house all the time. So I used to try to, my best to sound like Oscar. I transcribed solos and all these things. So I, I learned how to play the music authentically. But when it came to writing my own music, huh. you know, I always let my influences influence me. That I would give this out, and it's like, this is what I heard, you know? Mm. And it wouldn't have the normal chord progression that the average jazz, the normal jazz, two five ones, they right. call it, and all that right. stuff, would, wouldn't be there, it'd be something else. And, and it became- A-A-B-A. A-A-B-A, right. all that stuff. Right. I, I wrote from my hip hop sensibility a lot of times, you mm -hmm. know? I would have a bridge, you know? It'd be like, you know, it wouldn't yeah. be like A-A-B-A, -A -A. it would be like, you know, A, B, C, <laughs> you know, then, right. then, the, then a D, then I go back to an A, he's like, mm -hmm. wait, that's not, that's not 32 bars, you right, know? Right, right. That's not the normal thing. And so, for me, I kept that because mm -hmm. that was who I was, right. you know what I mean? Right. It's, and when I say that, a lot of people get it, I don't want people to get it twisted because sometimes when I say, don't, you know, let your influences influence you. That doesn't mean everything you play sounds like you're from church. You know what I mean? Yeah, because some, that, that, that happens. That can from the, happen or? That mostly, most of the time that happens. Because that, that influence is so strong. It's so strong to where they don't know how to separate it when they're playing a jazz tune, you don't have to sound like you're from church. Okay. Like church progression. There are certain things where it's like, okay, this is a church cat. Because everything's a church progression. Everything's this. Everything sounds like you're in praise and worship. And that's not supposed to happen all the time. Right. You know what I mean? Right. When you're writing your own music, fine, if that's what you're hearing. Huh. But when you're in a specific context playing, you know, in a jazz context, you have to know when to turn that off and when to turn it on. That's very interesting. 
you saying this because it brings up to me the issue of genres. Yep. So for you, you grew up hearing all of this. You mm -hmm. were exposed to it, you were around it, you ended up playing it. Um, so as I said to you back in September, mm -hmm. when I listen to your music and I hear you and I see you going in these different areas, even when I frankly didn't even know the extent of your musical associations with Ket Bilal and this one and that mm. most mm. deaf. I, mm. I, I didn't really know that. Mm. But I was like, this is organic. Mm. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't a um, wasn't a trick. It wasn't a marketing ploy. Right. Sometimes you can you can hear somebody and it doesn't sound like yeah. it really came from their heart. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. But with you, it was like, I was like, well, yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. Cat can play, but he's doing that, he's doing this. Mm -hmm. and, so, and with all my influences, I actually um, lived in those worlds music simultaneously. Simultaneously, right. that's why I can. That's why I feel like I play them well because I do. I I literally was on the road with the masters of that craft. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I played, like I said, I played my whole damn near my whole life in church. So right. that's one part. Right. But then when I got to New York, um, pretty much as soon as I got to New York, you know, I, I was in the company of. Common and Q-Tip and Most Def and all those guys. And yeah. I started in the Roots and Quest Love used to call me to play with the Roots when I was in college a lot. Then after college, I played with them a lot. So now I'm in the hip hop world. I'm playing that. I'm watching James Poyser and I'm watching, you know, yeah. and I'm watching, you know, I'm, I'm playing all these hip hop tracks now, learning how to play that vibe. You know, that's the vibe. I get it. Boom, boom, right. boom. With so a each genre vibe. has a particular vibe. Each genre has a particular vibe. And it's very <laughs> egotistical. A lot of jazz musicians think because they have a lot of chops that every other music is easy to play, and you can just do it. But that's not the case. Well, T.S. Monk, Delirious Monk's son, who for years played in R&B, he made it very clear. He's like, you know, you're playing that, you know, can you keep that time right, right there? Right. Can you keep it there? Not V, can you keep it there like bon, that? Bon Bon V, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's T.S. That's yeah. my cousin-in-law. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, small world. Small world. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So it's it's. Uh, I was I, basically I went through the training camp of each of those genres of music. Mm. You know what I mean? Basically, in the in a way. So then that ties into you as a producer, right? Which means that you you have the ability to be able to. Well, let me let you explain. Now, you you, you mentioned yourself as a composer, mm. of course, as a as a player, mm. band leader, now, as a producer. Mm. Explain how you see your role as a producer. I mean, as a producer, as far as my own stuff or producing other people? Other people. Well, as a producer, the thing a, a great producer is supposed to do is bring the best out of that person, what they are. Like great teachers do. Yeah, exactly. Bring, you know, some producers, when they produce something, you hear it and you're like, okay, so-and-so produced that. Mm. I hear it. You could hear the stamp of the producer. You hear the stamp of the producer, which is not always bad. Right, you know, you hear right. something babyface dead, you're like, that's babyface, you know. <laughs> Duh, that's face. You know, right. you get it. That's R. Kelly. You know, certain producers have a thing, and some people want that thing because that thing sells, and that's what you kind of want people to know that's you, and, and that's a different kind of producing. Right. But um, for what, I, what, what I'm doing, I like to bring the best out of that particular artist. So I try to dwell in what they, where they live, right. and figure that out, and then go Quincy from there. Quincy does that, right? Yeah, Quincy does that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You know, they didn't want Quincy to produce Michael because he was a jazz guy. You know, he was he the jazz cat. You know, they didn't want him doing off the wall. They they had to fight. He had to, Mike had to fight for Quincy. You know, to do off the wall because he was the jazz guy. He never really did R and B like that. You know, um, and boom, yeah. you know. history was made. History was made. Now, um, tell us about your collaboration with Kendrick Lamar on "To Pimp a Butterfly." Yeah, um, Kendrick. I first of all. I, a lot of my friends are on that, are producers on that, on um, all the Kendrick stuff from uh, um, Section 80 and uh, Good K Mass City, and all, all his records. Okay. Uh, one in particular, Terrace Martin, producer. Uh, I went to jazz camp with Terrace in high school. I was 15 oh. years old. Wow. And we met each other then. He's in LA. He's from LA. Okay. And we all met in Loyola, New Orleans. They had like a high, national high school jazz band thing. Right. We were both in there. So. We kept in touch all through the years. He used to call me up to do Snoop Dogg tours and stuff because he was Snoop Dogg's music director too. <laughs> uh, I could never, I was never around to do them. As soon as I got in college, I pretty much went in the role with 
um, Christian McBride and Russell Malone and right. you know Terrence and a few other people. Terrence so I, Blanchard. Terrence Blanchard. Mm-hmm. So I never, I was never really at school very much, mm-hmm. especially my sophomore year on. I was gone a lot. You know. Okay. Um, it's was, good to go to a school that, that allows you to do that. <laughs> yeah. I still have to fight some. You know, <laughs> some of them teachers was wishing they was on the gig. <laughs> no, you be in class. Yeah, right, right. But I'm playing at the Vanguard for a week. You know, so. But most of the teachers were super, super cool about that. And, right. and new school was really cool about that. Right. Um, that's, the, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's what you're there for. You know? Right. Um, so anyway, um, fast forward. I heard um, Good Kid, Mad City. And the, it blew me away. And I called Terrace. And I was like, yo, I have to be on the next CD somehow. To be on Kendrick's next album. He was like, gotcha, you'll make it happen. I was like, all right, bet. <laughs> and so um, fast forward, I'm doing my trio album, Covered, I put out last year. Which is his last recording. My last recording. Mm-hmm. And I'm in LA. And um, uh, that's the thing about going where the food is. Hmm. Because LA is one of those places where there's a lot of food. you know. So I did two recording nights there. First night I go, I'm recording in Studio A. I record it live in the studio at right. Capitol Records. Mm-hmm. In Studio B is John Mayer recording his record. He walks over and is like, hey, Rob, we never met in person. He's like, Robert, what's up, man? Blah, blah. I was like, hey, man, how you doing? Never met you, blah, blah, blah. He's like, after you finish your recording, want to come over to my studio and jam? I was like, all right. <laughs> so <laughs> I finished my recording, and I went next door and jammed with John Mayer for two hours. Mm. Duo, just me and him. Mm. You know, at the studio on tape, you know. On tape? On tape, yeah. Oh. Um, All right. All right. <laughs> so I don't know if anything came up. If I you know. Used any of that or anything, <laughs> but um, that happened. It was like, that was pretty awesome. Cool. Um, second night, before I walked on to play, Terrace calls me. He's like, yo, I'm at the studio, um, at Dr. Dre's studio. Can you come here right after you finish your session? I was like, all right. So... The funny, this is the funny part about this whole thing. I go in, I finish my recording session. Co- Mind you, Covered is a trio album, but it's not straight ahead jazz. You know, we're pretty much kind of doing cover songs, and it's not dang, take a day, take a day, take a day. You know? I, as soon as I go to the Dr. Dre studio, I walk in, Kendrick's there. I didn't even know what I was going for. Terrence was like, yo, it's Kendrick, come. it's Rob, boom, 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 boom. He was like, I want you to play on some joints. I was like, cool. The first song was Chang, Chicka Day, Chicka Day. Love it. It's Love the song. it. It's the the irony of that. The irony of that. I go from a jazz session <laughs> playing hip hop to a hip hop session playing jazz. Love it. You know what I mean? Love it. Love it. And so the first thing that yeah, Terrence is like, yo, this first tune, I, I want you to sound like McCoy Tyner. Love you know, it. it was a song called For Free. And Kendrick's like doing a poem over it. And we're swinging and like uh, going in. Like, oh, I, yeah, right. I yeah, know, right. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So I was like, this is so random. So then uh, after I did that song, uh, Kendrick pulled up a bunch of other songs that they already recorded. He was like, hey, can you hear anything over this? He would play it, and I'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, figure it out, record. i play, he's like, play anything you hear. And i just play. He'd be like, kill it, yo, pull up so-and-so. Pull up so-and-so, pull up so I sat there and I recorded eight songs in one sitting, right there. Just that Didn't night. send them the charts. No None charts, of no, I just played it, and I would listen to it. Thundercat was there too, so some of the songs he wrote, he came in and showed me the joint. You know, I learned it, and then he, he would record, and he would literally play what I heard, you know? And so, <clears throat> and so I'm on nine songs on the album. So I came back Grammy week and did, because um, we were nominated for Black Radio 2 at that time. Right. And so I came back Grammy week, and that's when we did the uh, Mortal Man, the very last song, mm-hmm. the Tupac interview on it. Right. Uh, that's when I recorded that. Thing. But so, but, you know, yeah, so I'm on nine joints. On the, on, it's only credited five songs. Because <laughs> after I did what I did, you know, months after that, they're thinking they they done forgot what I played on. What all you know, hip hop. That's one of the things in hip hop. You get your business right. So, um, <laughs> but I'm on there, so it's all right. good. But, it, but anyway, it was just an amazing opportunity, and it was the irony of you can say it, going from the jazz the jazz session playing hip hop to the hip hop session playing jazz. You know, I love it. And it's just love boom, it. you know. Yeah. What I mean? So um, describe your process. Let's go to your trio mm-hmm. of arranging. Like, um, you know, I, I listened to, I purposely did this. I listened to Covered, mm-hmm. and then I went back to your first two joints with, with the trio mm-hmm. so I could hear 
and you know it's identifiable, but with covered, um, there's like some it seems like some intricate arrangements, you know, and textures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you always have you always set up a groove, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's there's surprises in there all over the place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Describe your process of, of arranging when you're with your cats. And well, I also want you to tell us the two cats that you that you'd be playing with today, mm -hmm. you know, how far y'all go back. Oh, Damian, Damian Reed and Vicente Archer, my trio. Yeah. I go back with them since nine, uh, 2000, 2000, 2000, yeah, oh. not 2000, yeah, 2000. Mm. Uh, I met Damian in college, the drummer in college. Okay. And, um, but the process with them is, It's pretty much on those other albums. The earlier albums were just original, mostly original songs. And I, I like to write for those particular musicians in that seat. That Duke Ellington vibe. Yeah, exactly. That's why Duke's band is different from any other band, because he wrote for the cats that were there. Right. You know, he had these people in mind. So the whole thing has a sound and a characteristic versus writing just the drum chair, mm -hmm. the piano chair, this chair, that chair. You write for a specific person. And you don't write a lot because I don't like to write a lot of stuff. I like to let that particular musician give me him, you know what I mean? Like when I write for Vicente or when I write for Derek Hodge in my experiment band, when I'm writing something, I hear Derek doing him. I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna kill this. <laughs> so I don't wanna write, play specifically this. You play specifically the, you know. Sometimes writers can do that and for me, when I do that with, this, with my bands, it kind of puts it in a box and it could be bigger than what I'm thinking. It's almost, it, it, what they're going to do is going to be better than what I'm going to tell them. To so do. what do you actually write? Those trust I use. What I write... Um, I mean, for them. For them. I mean, for the most part, I'll tell them a skeleton, like, depending on the song. Obviously, yeah. there are some songs I have that, in trio days, that have specific bass line I would right. write. Right. But then I'll be like, get away from it and do you, you know, right. and, and let the drummer kind of feel. I'll be like, it's in seven. This is kind of the vibe go for what you hear. You right. know what I mean? Right. So it's a, it's a mixture of that. Some things I'm specific on because I have to be specific because I have a certain thing I'm going for. Mm -hmm. But even in that, I give them room to interpret it a little bit. I don't do specifically every little thing. You right. know what I mean? And uh, to me, that's, the, that's how you find, that's how you have the best groups. That's when it's a group because mm -hmm. you're letting each person bring their personality into the music. Right. And no other band's going to sound like these exact three people. You know what I mean? Right. Versus you writing something for this and another person. I could go to another band, do the same thing, right. and then it sounds the same because you're doing exactly what that. You're reading the music and you're doing exactly what I need you to do. But right. I like to. You give me your feel. You give me your feel, and then it's going to sound like you know yeah. something that no other cats sound like. You know, right. it's what Miles did. Miles yeah. was the best at that. Miles was. A, that's one of the things he was a master at. Miles was a master at finding the right guys. Right. He didn't change. Right. You know, <laughs> Miles never really changed right. as far as his, his playing. He just got the right cats under him because he knew what sound he was going for. And he was like, okay, these young guys know the vibe, boom, 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 let y'all do y'all vibe, put my thing on top of it, and now it's something. Did boom. you hear the story about when, when Miles first got Herbie, uh, Tony, uh, Ron, and Wayne together? Which one? Yeah, right. Make sure. <laughs> yeah, he. Um, I think this is the one where they first went to his house. Uh -huh. He was in another room, uh -huh. and they didn't know that he was listening to them from the other room. Okay, but he was just checking that. He was just checking them out. Right, right, know? right, 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 right. That makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that totally makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I like a master of masters, teacher of teachers. I mean, so many leaders came from Miles. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm going to ask one more question, and y'all get ready because I'm going to let y'all get in here. Um, I'm going to talk about tradition and continuity of tradition. Um, I did a, a presentation here on uh, the great writer about blues and jazz, Albert Murray. And one of the things he says in his book, The Hero and the Blues, is that, of course, tradition is that which continues. That's obvious. But he says, if the tradition is not, and this is my paraphrase, renewed, then the tradition can atrophy. So you actually need change for the tradition to m remain alive. The tradition is change. Also, you know okay. what I mean? What is the tradition? Well, you think of the tra tradition of, that's why people talk to me about that stuff. Like, you don't even know what you're talking about from the beginning. Your question doesn't even make sense. 
why don't you keep more than tradition? Which tradition? Which era? Which one? Right. The 30s? Because when the, when the 40s hit, that was something different. Right. When the 50s hit, that was something different. When the 60s hit, and each era looked back on the other era, or, and looked, or looked ahead of the other era, like, what are you doing? That's not the tradition. You know, they all did that. <laughs> the 30s look at the 40s like, what are you doing? The 40s look at the 50s. What are you doing? The 50s look at the 60s. What are you doing? That's, that's the tradition. You make the, <laughs> if you're not making the other era mad, you're not following just tradition. Just tradition is to piss you off. <laughs> you know? Or they call it, they, in the academy, they call it paradigm shifts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but that is the tradition. The tradition is to honor the history but not be held back by the history. And you keep it moving, right? You know, you keep it moving, and but you honor it, and you know it's there. Right. You pay homage to it, but you keep it moving right. because that's the only way to keep it alive. Miles said it: if it ain't moving, it's dead. Right. Period. Right. Yeah. All right. I see a lot of head shaking out there. All Amen. Right, so, so, <laughs> so why don't y'all get up in this? All right. So if you got a question or or a comment, raise your hand and and partake. Yes, sir. yes, this is Professor Michael Doc Woods, Hello, sir. professor of music here for nice many years. You. Great composer, bassist. I knew you were a musician. <laughs> Okay, sure. Do you see any way in the immediate future on your event horizon where you could revolutionize, particularly in black churches, what the black pastors will let the young musicians do? I think that's already changing. I, granted, they kicked me out of church in 99. Um, <laughs> 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 But no, I got kicked out. Um, well, because, you know, g thank God, you know, when I was playing in church in Houston, when I got a scholarship to come to New York, my pastor in Houston, Ratliff, plays this church called, um, called um, 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 Brentwood Baptist Church. And my pastor said, I'm going to call my boy up in Harlem, and you're going to play at his church when you get there. So I had a good job the first week I got to New York. We got to New York. They put me over the male chorus, first of all. I'm 17 or 18 years old over the male chorus. I was like, no! Um, <laughs> they were horrible. It was really bad. Um, and then a few, week, few, few months after that, they put me on the teen choir. I was like, yes. So I teen choir, everything was cool. At that point, I started getting calls from, you know, like I said, Christian McBride. And I started going out of town. And at that point, it wasn't cool to go out of town. I mean, you got to be at church. Mm -hmm. So after a while, he was like, you make a decision. You got to be here or not. So I had, I had to leave. Um, it's now become cool for your music director to be gone because the pastor can say, uh, our music director's out with Mary J. Blige. <laughs> <laughs> this Sunday, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or when you get back from tour. All my friends that still play in church tell me that. I got a bunch of cats that play with everybody, you know. And, and they, the pastor comes back and, uh, uh, yes, our bassist just got back from the road from uh, the Beyonce tour. You know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So it makes it hot. It makes the church, gives the church a little popping thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, each church is like, who you who your piano player play for? You know? <laughs> you know, so I think now it's become a lot, a lot more acceptable. Yes. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, and, and uh, I think that's just the culture now. You know, you do, do other stuff and you go back and I play at this church. It's almost like giving church publicity when you're on the road yeah. a lot of times because people want to kind of, People want to go to the church that has really good music as well. The yes. younger cats, younger people tend to want to go to the church with good music. Older cat people want to go to church for the for the, the good preacher. So if you have both, it's great, you know. But the best choir and the best musicians get a lot of the younger people. You know what yes. I mean? So if 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 the word on the street is, you know, Maxwell's band plays over here, you know, <laughs> then all right, you know, then that that works. You know, I played I played with Maxwell for five years in 2009 when he came back with Pretty Wings and all that stuff. So I did that tour from 09 to 2013. And my boy, Shedrick Mitchell, was on Oregon. And he held down a church gig every Sunday. You know, but um, he was telling me, that's why I know a lot of these things. He's like, yeah, man, my pastor always, you know, he's always saying that stuff. But it fascinates people, you know. Uh, but I thought you were going to ask me if I was going to do a gospel album, because I am. 
Really? Uh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going to do a black radio gospel album. Nice. That'll work. Wow. That'll work. Is this yeah. the first time you said it? No. Anywhere? No. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm a journalist. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but I've been saying it for like two years oh, now. Okay. Bobby I've Jones been saying it. First. Bobby Jones going to get it first. Bobby Jones, right. <laughs> Funny thing is, I played on Bobby Jones' show when I was in 11th grade. Uh, didn't Bobby Jones get it canceled? I think he's off the air now. Huh? This is the last year. Yeah, I, play, I played with a choir on there when I was in high school. I'll never forget that. Now, by the way, you're not with you, they have noticed you don't hear yourself through the mic. It's for the camera. Oh, okay. Go right ahead. Oh. All right, my name is Johnny Enoch. Um, my question is... Uh, Enoch? Yes. I have a song called Enoch's Meditation. Yes, yes, and I love it. I, re I yeah. really do. I love it. Uh, my question is, is, do you or do you have a staff? Are you mentoring any other people? who would like to be in the industry or in the music? Um, I don't have time at the moment. I do have like, you know, when I'm, if I have cats that want to come, if I'm in New York, I'm in New York and I'm doing something, I have a few musician, younger cats that they want to come through and hang out and check it out. They can do that periodically here and there, but I haven't done a, like an actual mentoring thing yet, like hardcore, because I'm just all over the place. And I, I even tried to give lessons for a year, and that didn't work out. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it just my schedule was too crazy. And I, I have a, a seven-year-old son myself. And oh, okay. So when I'm, when, I, when, I, when I'm not crazy, he gets all my attention. He's here, you know. Oh, right. Yeah, Riley's here. Uh, he gets all my attention now, so I, I don't have time for another one. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know. But eventually I want to do, eventually I want to open up a school of some sort, you know, okay. um, that has the teachers that are like minds of like me and and use that because I think the tools that I can the tools that I have and a lot of my friends have musician friends have is uh, something that can sustain an actual a musician in today's time you know what I mean a lot of times colleges put out these like jazz robots and people just sitting around broke because they don't know any other kind of music can't play another kind of music so, well, it used to be where cats Yeah, that was the thing. That was what it is. <laughs> Blues, yeah, all that. Boogie Woogie, all that, you know. A lot of my favorite art musicians was Boogie Woogie, played Mo Group, was all that, you know. John Coltrane, walking the bar. Are we allowed to take photos or no? Sorry? Are we allowed to take any photos? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, so what I'm hoping, go ahead. What's the uh, highlight of your career thus far? And is there another black radio coming? Um. The highlight of my career, I would, I would probably say winning my first Grammy, um, and it being an R and B Grammy, right. you know, uh, for Black Radio, the original Black Radio album. Um, I think that was the highlight pinnacle of my career because that's like winning the NBA championship. You know, if you're a basketball player, you win a championship. That's the highlight of being a basketball player. <laughs> you know, so for me, that was one of the big big moments. You know what I mean? Because it was such an underdog kind of thing. You know what I mean? It was really like. We went against totally. We went against the music industry. We went against radio. You know, we went against all the things that are supposed to work. Right. I used uh, all the music was live. You know, couldn't get all the people together in one room, and so I canceled the. I actually canceled the. I stopped the record. I, I didn't even. I was like, we can't get everybody together, and I was like, forget it. Let's just go on a, on, a, on tour. So we went on tour. And in the middle of my tour, my man just called me and said, I don't know what, how it's happened, but all these people, all 20 people, their man just called me, and they're all available this one week. So it, it was the next week. So I canceled my tour from Europe. I canceled a week, and I flew to LA. And that's why, a lot of this, that's why I did so many cover songs on black radio. We did like half of the record's cover songs, because I didn't have anything written, because it was so last minute. You know what I mean? So I did a bunch of covers, because I didn't have any songs. And a lot of the songs we did were on the spot. The song I did with Legacy, she did re we redid one of my old joints, FTB. Because we literally, she came to the studio at 3 in the morning, and we sat around a table. We sat around a table, and she was like, what do you want to play? You know, I was like, I don't know. What do you want to do? And we threw out some songs. Nah, mm, nah. And I, then I, I said, hey, this song. And she was like, OK, cool. Listen to it, wrote lyrics to it, go win the studio. 
with King, they were a new group, you know, and um, my homegirl was managing them. And I went to their crib, and I needed to do my laundry because I just got back from tour. They had a laundry. They had, they had a thing there. So I, <laughs> I literally walked into the studio in, in the living room, and I came up with this little idea. And I was like, here's the idea. I'm going to do my laundry. So I did laundry, and I came back. Song was done. I was like, great. Um, <laughs> no, this is literally how the album got done. Like, you know, so I always tell people the universe co-produces your album. You know what I mean? I've learned that from a long time ago. The universe will co-produce your album. And when things are not going right, it may be for the better. But you, it's hard to realize that in the moment. But it may take a left turn to something you didn't know. Like the All Yeah song. Well, All Yeah is probably the one song... That's probably the one song I would say catapulted my career from one to another because radio grabbed that song really quick and started playing on the radio station. So I started getting all these offers to do things. And think about, oh yeah, um, I recorded the music, the, just the music in LA. I called up Music Soul Child. I was like, yo, I have this idea for a song, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing this record, blah, 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 blah. He's like, all right, bet. Come to Atlanta. Let's record it. So I, I flew to Atlanta. And uh, I was there for three days. The, sec the first day I went in, he heard it, listened to it, walked around, was kind of writing to it. Cool. He wrote a first verse. Then he wrote the second verse. He said, I'm going to record it tomorrow. I was like, cool. That night, I went to um, a music festival in Atlanta. They had a music festival happening. Because Foreign Exchange was there. And Fonte asked me to sit in with them that night. He heard I was in Atlanta. So I went to sit in with Foreign Exchange. I sat in. After I got off the keys, Chrisette Michelle was there because she was ending the night. She was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, I was sitting there with Foreign Exchange, but I'm actually recording my album. She was like, oh, word, that's what's up, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, how long have you been town? She was like, well, my flight got canceled. I was going to take a red eye tonight, but my flight got canceled because there's a big storm in New York. And I was like, what you doing after this? <laughs> she was like, nothing. And I was like, come by the studio. <laughs> and that's how she got my song. Because she couldn't get on the flight. And, she, and I saw her and was like, hey, you want to come out? You know? And that's, became my, that's probably my biggest song, wow. you know, radio-wise. That's, like, you know, that's my biggest song. Yeah. So is there another black radio in the works? Yeah, so not in the works, but definitely. I, I'm going to do another black radio three and, like I said, a gospel, black radio gospel album. Do you work with a lot of um, unknown? No, no. Uh, not at the moment. I have a lot of, I have, trust me, I have a lot of friends that are unknown artists that are dope. I have a lot of great art, know a lot of great artists that are dope, unknown. But I even told them in the beginning, people were like, why well, don't you have me on you know? And I'm like, let me put myself in a position first right. so that I can bring y'all up. And people have to understand that. I put myself in a position and I have to use people who are already established in order to do that, you know what I mean? So now I'm in a position, I could do that. I could bring certain people who no one knows, but now I have clout and people uh, listen to what I think, you know? So if I say this person's dope, a lot of people are gonna be like, they must be dope, <laughs> you know? But if I would've did that from the beginning, they don't know me or you, we ain't helping each other out, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so eventually I wanna do, I'm gonna do an album, I'm gonna do an album with a bunch of underground artists that no one knows. That people should know. I'm, de I'm definitely going to do that record too. You know. Yeah. So um, I think that there's been a lot of uh, movement towards uh, infusing jazz and funk into uh, rap and R&B, and it's not necessarily new. Like there's always been people like D'Angelo and Erica Badu, but with you know people like uh, Flying Lotus and Kendrick Lamar, obviously, and Chance the Rapper, who are doing that a lot, and it's becoming really big. Um, what do you think is the cause of that at this time now in history? being such a big movement that's happening right now? Um, well, I think there was two waves of it. I think there was one wave in the early 90s or late 90s, the, the Neo Soul movement. Mm -hmm. I was in New York when that happened. I didn't realize at the time, but it was happening. I got to New York in 97. I met Bilal in 97. We started working on his album. And we were working on his album at Electric Lady Studios. Jimmy and Hendrix. Jimmy Hendrix Studio. In it. And Erica was on the middle, we're on the top floor, Erica's in the middle floor, and D'Angelo was at the bottom floor. So I literally watched D'Angelo make voodoo a lot. I didn't even know. I was there for that. I was there for comments like Water for Chocolate. 
because Bilal was singing background, and I didn't even know Common in ninety in ninety nine. I didn't know. I didn't really know who he was. I wasn't hardcore to hip hop. I came from Texas. I knew Scarface. You know, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I knew the Ghetto Boys. So I was teaching Common piano lessons. I used to go to his house and give him piano lessons. You know, he lived around the corner. Me, Bilal, Erica, and Common lived within four blocks of each other in Brooklyn. So Erica used to come over to my crib and play me stuff, ideas. And, what do you think about this song, Orange Moon? I'm, trying to think about, you know, because I was the jazz guy. I was Bilal's friend who played jazz. And they always like, what do you think about this jazz, you know? And Kama was like, I want to learn jazz, you know? So I, you know, I give him panelists. So that was all a regular thing for me, you know? And um, I think it was just like a, a movement. The Neil Soul movement happened and live musicians came back and poetry was pop, started popping then in 97 spoken word and spoken word goes right with jazz and that whole thing it was just all that combined that that scene actually happened a block from my house where I used to live a few years ago in Brooklyn at the spot called Brooklyn Moon actually that's where Saul Williams first did his first poem and that's where Erica used to go so that was one wave right. and that and I was a part of that wave with Bilal's band we we're going on tour with Erica and Common opening up for those guys and the roots and all this stuff then Neil Soul kind of died down and then, not to toot my own horn, but when black radio came around, I think that started another wave of college kids, you know, coming up and doing their own thing. You know, that's why you have groups like the Internet, people from Berkeley, you know, Internet, Highest Coyote, Snarky, all, you know, all these other artists coming up, doing their thing and getting recognized. We're in a good time right now because the music industry is like opening their ears to it. After we won an R&B Grammy, which never happened, an instrumental band has never won an R&B Grammy before in the history of it, you know what I mean? And so when we won that, everybody Googled, who are you, first of all, you know? <laughs> and then they listened to it, and then it's like, oh. And people kind of became open to it. That's why you see all these other bands now coming into those categories and stuff, and it's, it's another wave of, of, of uh, music that's, you know, all doing that. It's, it's, it's amazing to see, you know what I mean? I would say the precursor. Totally. Yep. You had a uh, guru. It's a jazz mm -hmm. thing that was early. Tribe. Tribe. Tribe called Quest. Yep. You know, yep. Like that. So all those things, and a lot of those things were the DJ mixing the jazz in. The jazz was never like. In terms of instrumental. Yeah. Because right, right. the thing I like about my band, especially the experiment band, which is different from most, because a lot of people, I've had smart Alex ask me, that's been done before. What well, are you doing different? Like, well, we're you one band. Yeah, yeah, all that, yeah. Like, we're one band playing hip-hop, playing jazz, and playing R&B to a very high level, to the point where the jazz cats are like, y'all are the best jazz group we've ever heard. And then hip-hop, the roots, Amir is like, y'all y'all play the hip-hop, y'all play hip-hop the best. You know what I mean? One band getting that kind of credit and playing all those things is different than a DJ playing the jazz part, mixing in the saxophone, you know, or mixing in the, or scratching. Yeah, or Roy, you know, you know, and that, so that's the difference and, and it's the live band aspect and people playing all these different genres themselves and not needing a DJ to, okay, you're the hip hop part, you know, you know, now we're mixing jazz and hip hop, you know, that's been done before, you know. What I mean? so. so let's give Mr. Glass for a hand. What time is it? Five, 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 five. And Fred Thomas in here. Oh, five to seven. What time do I start? Seven, seven, thirty. I start 7.30? 7.30. Yeah. We can do five more minutes. Okay. If it's okay with y'all. Yeah. All right, cool. Go ahead. All right, nice. Can you, can you get the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was going to ask, um, who are you listening to most right now? Who's your, who's like, who are your favorite groups? Favorite um, groups? Yeah, favorite groups or artists coming up kind of right now. Who are you listening to? I haven't to? been listening as much these last few months because I've been doing so many projects on my own. And when I do projects on my own, I purposely don't listen to a lot of other stuff, honestly. Okay. But... Um, I like the internet. I just kind of got hit to them last year. I like the, uh, they got the good vibes. I like hiatus. They have good vibes. Uh, those two groups, as far as new, rising, up and coming cats, you know what I mean? I like those people. I like Laura Mavula. You know Laura Mavula? I don't. Know. She's from London. She's dope.
you've, you've covered David Bowie's songs, he just passed. Mm -hmm. Maurice White, Earth, Wind, and Fire just passed. Yep. Speak about those two in terms of what your, your, your thoughts about them in particular. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, Maurice White is, you know, uh, they were doing hip, they were doing, not hip hop and jazz, but they were doing funk and soul and jazz. Gospel and African Everything. Brazilian too. Everything. That's right. Um, there's an album. Um, I am. That's the way the world. Way the world. That's the way of the world. That for that still to this day that has my one of my favorite interludes of all time. Oh, it, by, uh, uh, no, it's an interlude after. After. Uh, uh, I forgot the song. I forgot the song. It's after. Mm. But it's a. Oh. Uh, 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 Bobby Lyle, oh, I think. Right. I think it's a. Bobby Lyle. Anyway, that's. Yeah. They were ahead of their time for that. That interlude, it's, it's, it's literally my favorite. It's probably my favorite interlude ever. It's like 45 seconds, and it's so dope, you know. And the way they did it was dope, and ahead of their time, the way they did it, too. And they took something and flipped it. They took something, a, a, another song of their celebration, and flipped it and, and put the tape and made it go backwards. And then Bobby Lyle soloed over it going forward. It was just, what? Really? That's what you're going to do? And it was so crazy. And on the same album, they have a jazz interlude. Uh, I forget what it's called. Jazz, something jazz. But they just, they just walk up to you, hear them laughing, they get on the set, and they start playing. They're like playing a blues or something like that. But then it goes right after that, it goes into the way of the world. You know what I mean? And that was just normal back then. And I knew that record for a long time, because my mom used to play that all the time. My dad used to play all the time. You know what I mean? So... That's one of the things I would hear, and it's like, oh yeah, that's normal. Jazz, going into this, what, what's, what's the problem? You know what I mean? Uh, David Bowie, um, you know who reminds me of David Bowie? Bilal. He reminded me of David Bowie a lot, um, uh, artistically. And Bilal's weird, and so is David Bowie, super weird. And they're very much, um, they play characters when they sing. It's not about, let me show you. A lot of singers, every time they sing, it's like, let me show you how good I sing. I don't care what the song's about. I don't care about selling the song to you. I want you to know I can sing very good, you know. And some singers are about characters and being a character for that song, like it's a part, you know what I mean? Yeah. And trying to tell a story. Prince is one of those people, you know what I mean? Uh, Bilal's one of those. David Bowie's one of those to me. He, David Bowie can actually really sing, but that's what they're his point. You know what I mean? You would catch it. You're like, oh, wait, he do a run? You know? It, but you would catch it. He can, he's really dope. But that wasn't his main thing. That's, that's how Bilal is, too. And that, the David Bowie album, Space Oddity, uh, uh, it's a very obscure album. Uh, but I, I recorded the song on there called um, Letter to Hermione uh, for Black Radio 1 back in 2011. And uh, when I heard it, it just reminded me of Bilal. And I didn't, at that point, I didn't have a, a song I wanted Bilal to sing yet. And I was just listening to that album, Space Out of Me. And then that song came on, and I was like, wow. You know, it's just like, oh my God. And the way he sings it, if you, got, if you haven't heard the original, listen to the original. It's just David Boy and guitar, maybe two guitar players. And it's just so sincere and so honest. You know, and I think that's what's missing, too, the honesty in the music, you know, which is what also give people, makes you different, because you're, you're really being honest in what you're giving, you know what I mean? God, I, there's a lot of songs I, even when I'm in the studio, I'll choose a take, even though my piano solo was better on this take. The vibe and the spirit and the honesty of this take is better, and I'll choose that one. You know, I don't like to take solos from here and put it over there, because, you know, cause I, I'm not, I don't like that. Because now the bass is, because when I play, the, the bass player and the drummer are reacting to what I did. So if I move my solo over, now it's sounding like they're not listening to me. You know, I mean, it, the gelling isn't that spiritual thing that's like really connection isn't there. But I take a solo that's not as good because the connection's there and leave it. You do that, you know. Bless you. Exactly. Yes. Um, where do you see music in the next 10 years from dealing with the whole fusion thing that we have going on now, um, mixing in the whole like neo soul gospel feel and everything? Where do you see it going? 
in the I next year. Man, I don't know, because there's two things, there's two waves going on. There's one side, it's like, what the hell are you doing in music? And then there's another side where it's like, that's awesome. You know, and they're both doing this. And I don't know, you know, I, I have no idea. I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't know. I hope people keep, like I said, there's always waves of, there's waves of great organic music, you know, you know, so I, and there's always bad music. Bad music never goes in waves. It's just there. <laughs> you know, it's like the good shit's wavy and the bad music's just there, you know, so, you know, I'm hoping the good music can stop being as wavy. Or, you know, the good music's always been there. It's just not as accessible as other music. You know, it's not in your face, not as obvious. You gotta dig for it, you know what I mean? Versus bad music, it's in your face. When you get the cab, it's gonna be there. You know, you know you could sing songs that you hate because of that. You know what I mean? Because they get so much marketing for these bad songs. You can see yourself doing something with Beyonce? Old girl? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I don't know when. It's funny. When Beyonce first went solo, um, I had just got out of college. I think it was 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And they were about to put her solo, get her solo career thing happening. So she called me to be her music director. So, and it was right when Neo Soul was happening. So her, when she went solo, she was going to go Neo Soul, you know. So we talked for a good three months, getting together, I had the band together, and, you know, we were about to rock it. Then she was like, okay, they changed my whole thing up. Not happening anymore. And then she went, that's when she went pop, you know, totally pop. So they, they, they immediately switched that up, you know. But I totally see at some point, you know, us doing something at some point. I don't know when, but. All right, I think it's time to go. We got a show to see. All right. All right. All right.